It was the beginning of winter when I had to make a big change of location for work. There was no way around it really due to my position, unless I decided to quit. Obviously, I didn't really want to do that. Unfortunately though, they were making me move several states over to a place I'd never been to before. It was a small town a decent way outside of the city that just so happened to have a large warehouse that I'd be working at. With no real way to get there beforehand and scope it out, I had to just rent a place without ever seeing it in person. The options were minimal given the size of the town, so I wasn't very confident in my choice. I tried my best to keep my hopes up anyway, when the day came, I left my hometown and drove two days to the new place. When I first made it to the town and drove through the roads, I felt very out of place. I was always a city person, and this was the most small town looking town I'd ever been to. There were very few neighborhoods with newer houses, as most of them were very old, 1900s looking homes. The neighborhood my place was in seemed to be a mix of these houses, which looked a bit strange. At least my house was one of the somewhat newer ones, though. I parked on the side of the street and walked up the driveway, which had a shipping container in the middle that was delivered with all my stuff in it. I opened up an envelope with the house key in it and unlocked the front door. Stepping inside the first time and seeing an empty house, is never the best way to judge if it'll be good or not, but this place looked a lot worse than it did in the pictures. There were cracks running along the walls, water stains all over the ceiling, things that must have been photoshopped out of the pictures. The rooms were not very spacious either. Honestly, after seeing all the other houses, this one was probably one of the best in town still. Once I was done looking through the rooms, I went back to my car and got out the air mattress and a couple of backpacks full of things. It was already really late, and I didn't want to do any big moving until the morning. I decided to set up the air mattress in the living room. I don't know, sleeping in an empty bedroom in an empty house made me feel uncomfortable. I decided to simply stick it out in the living room until I'd moved my stuff in. I turned off all the lights and laid down. I was really tired. I was still having a lot of trouble getting comfortable though. About 33 minutes went by of me just laying there and trying to fall asleep. That was when a sudden knock at the front door startled me awake. I looked over at the door and then tapped my phone to check the time. It was 1am. Nobody should be at my door this late. I got up and quietly went over, looking through the peephole. There were two men, standing on the porch and looking at the door. It was quite dark, and I couldn't make out any defining features. I stayed there and watched them not saying anything. I waited for them to leave. They knocked again, showing no signs of leaving anytime soon. I wondered what these guys could possibly need at this time of night. I couldn't really think of anything reasonable. Another 30 seconds passed by until one of them started to turn around and walk away, followed by the other one. After they were gone, I sat back on the mattress and tried to figure out why they'd come here. I spent at least 15 minutes just laying down and thinking. I guess I was more tired than I thought though, because I drifted off to sleep soon after. When I woke up, it must have been about a half an hour later. I was still half asleep, but I heard a long and quiet creak coming from across the house. I quickly got up and turned on the light. I didn't know if it was just the house creaking or something else entirely. I was already on edge from earlier. I walked down to the room where I'd heard the sound from. At first, nothing seemed to be off. It was just an empty room. That was until I noticed a very small gap between the window frame. It was just slightly open. My stomach dropped as I closed and locked it. I had no idea if it had been like that before or not. I didn't even remember if I'd checked the windows. My mind was racing, making me go through the whole house and check every window and door. 
As I went around the upstairs rooms, I noticed a single scuffed shoe print right in the middle of the hallway. Thankfully, there didn't seem to be anyone in the house anymore, but it didn't take away from the horror of it. Police came quickly after I called, confirming it was very likely someone had come in that night through the window. In fact, one or two people must have come in through the downstairs window and walked through the entire house to get upstairs. This all happened while I was sleeping in the middle of an empty room. It's a terrifying thought. You just have to wonder what they did when they saw me and what they were planning on doing. I always wonder if it had anything to do with the two men I'd seen just half an hour before. I still live in that same house, but I've never had any more strange encounters since that very first night. This happened back when I was about 17. For reference, I'm a woman. My story may not be quite as scary as some, but I'm writing this as a cautionary tale. I was on my way home from school. Normally, I walked 95% of the way there with my two friends. They turned off one block before I got to my house. This day, though, I was alone. They had both missed school that day. I'd like to state that I was taught to always be aware of my surroundings. My parents were always on me about being safe, especially my mom, so I didn't walk around with my headphones in or anything like that. My neighborhood wasn't bad or anything, but being a woman, you know that you can never be too careful. Especially because I was all alone. On most days, I was alone when I got home, and then I would walk across the street to grab my little brother from school when he got out. But that day, my dad was home. His car was in the shop and mom was at work, so there was no car in the driveway to signify this. When I came home, I came in like I always did and tossed my book bag on the floor. I didn't even bother to lock the door behind me. I just walked into the kitchen like always. I remembered my dad was home, so I yelled out to him that I was back. I don't even recall him answering back. I just went back in like whatever. I was half paying attention anyway. My dad walked in just as the phone rang. It was the neighbor from across the street, who I'll refer to as Patty. She was quite a nice lady that we had known for years now. Her whole family lived in the two houses across from us, all really solid people, and we always looked out for each other, you know, helped each other out whenever we could. That was the way it should be, but rarely is nowadays. She asked my dad immediately if I was okay. He responded with a confused, um, yeah, why wouldn't she be? Patty told him that she'd seen two men following me all the way into the yard as I came in from school. She couldn't see them when I went up to the door, but she said they had been behind me, hiding behind things and stalking me, always just a few feet behind. They hurried out of the yard about a minute or two after I entered the home. I'm guessing that was about the time I went inside and yelled out to tell my dad I was home. My dad asked if she saw which way they'd gone. Patty said they'd walked around the corner and made a right. My dad thanked her and hung up. He told me that someone had followed me home. He also grabbed up his keys. I was so confused. It took me a minute to understand what was happening. My dad told me to lock the doors, and then he took off. I was so scared. I didn't want something to happen to my dad if he caught those guys. God knows what he would have done to them, or what they might have done to him if they by some chance had weapons or something. He came back a short time later. He told me that he'd driven around the neighborhood a bit, and even stopped by Patty's to ask what they looked like, but nothing came of it. I'm telling this story because I want to remind people to be cautious, especially women out there. I really thought I was being careful, but apparently I wasn't careful enough. Make sure to glance around you while you walk. If you pass by someone, make it a point to look them in the eyes and let them know you see them. Please be safe out there. I know I was lucky that day. Any other day, it might not have been the case.
So, when I was in middle school, I'm not ashamed to admit that I was quite naive. In hindsight, I should have been honest with my parents about what was going on. When I was about 13 to 15, I had had the same bus driver for about three years. I was very shy and antisocial and didn't really like people much. I usually sat at the front of the bus, considering I had zero of my friends riding the same bus due to our route differences. One particular day, my bus driver asked how my day was. He tried to strike up a conversation with me when he saw that I didn't really talk much to anybody. Every day, it became a bit of a routine. I'd sit in the front and chat with the bus driver about my day. One day, my bus driver brought me a snack after telling him that I didn't like the school's lunches. I probably shouldn't have taken food from a stranger, but in my adolescent mind, I felt like he must be trustworthy. He began to ask me more personal questions, getting to know me in the way a friend would. I still tried to answer quite vaguely when I could. His gifts became more frequent, and he began saying I was his favorite. He would do this on numerous occasions. It got to the point where other kids on the bus grew jealous of all the gifts and food he would bring me. Every day for about a year and a half, my bus driver spoiled me with food and gifts. When other children asked if they could have something as well, he'd always say no, or that it was only meant for me. That should have been the first red flag. The fact that I was the only one he was treating like this. It became apparent to me that the other kids were taking notice, and regrettably I began bragging about how loved I was by the bus driver. All jokes aside, once I started doing that, it began becoming actually creepy. He started complimenting me, just small compliments here and there. All of a sudden, they became just as frequent as the food and gifts he brought me. It started with him complimenting me on my shoes or my glasses, then how beautifully blonde I was. It all came to a halt when he showed me a picture of his wife and told me, and I quote, you know, the reason you're my favorite is because you remind me exactly of her. I was kind of stunned and left feeling uneasy and awkward. I happened to glance at one of the boys on the bus. This kid was 15, but he was already 5 foot 10 and very beefy. The kid, who I'll call Nick, glared at the bus driver. He began showing me picture after picture of his wife. I have to agree that if I'd been 20 years older, I'd probably look like the spitting image of her. Nick began watching the situation more. His stop was two before mine, yet he only got off when I did. If I ever didn't, he wouldn't get off either. For the next few months, I caught the bus driver staring at me through the large rear view mirror on several occasions. During one bus ride, it became unnerving just how much he was staring at me. He was always polite, but whenever Nick was around me, he seemed to get visibly upset by this. One day, we walked into the bus, and the bus driver made an announcement. Listen up, everyone. If your listed bus stop is what's listed from the school, it's where you're getting off at. He looked directly at Nick while saying this. He forced Nick to get off at his own stop. Since 75% of the kids also got off at that exact same stop, the bus was quite empty, to say the least, by the time my own came. Only around six of us were still on the bus. His eyes would always be glued on me. Things got worse. He began trying his very best to make me the last one off. I always avoided being the last person for obvious reasons. It came to a point where he began to directly offer to drop me off in front of my house so I didn't have to walk all that distance from the bus stop. This was by no means allowed, especially because his bus was not labeled as a special case bus. At my school, there were certain buses assigned for special pickup and drop-offs, but those were for people with crutches or broken bones and stuff like that. I always declined his offers, which seemed to really upset him. It was never enough to draw attention, though. There was one occasion where he had dropped me off at the bus stop, 
and instead of going straight on his way, he turned down my road where my house was. I caught him staring at me through the door. That unnerved me the most, because why was he trying to figure out what my house was? I told my friends about this, but they casually brushed it off as the creepy old guy that everybody had experienced. I laughed about it with my friends, but I had told my friend to ride home with me from now on, and I'd walk her home after. She began doing this. The bus driver would only be creepy with me on days that I didn't have my best friend present as a barrier between us. I was extremely creeped out one day when it was the ending of the semester. We had fall break coming up. He had an entire box of snacks he had gotten me, but what sent a shiver up my spine was when I first got on the bus. He then told me to be the very last one off. What the fuck? Well, I went and told Nick about this since he'd been helping me. He ignored the rule of getting off at the wrong stop and stayed so I wouldn't have to be the last one off. When it came time to get off, Nick and I waited to be the last ones. Nick would only get off after me. Our bus driver was not pleased with this. He told Nick to get off before me and even tried to threaten him. Nick flat out said no. Suddenly, the bus driver got super agitated. He agreed before huffing and falling back down in his seat. When I got off, he practically threw the box of snacks at me and sped off, barely allowing Nick the time to plant both feet on the ground. I immediately threw that box away and then went home. Nick walked with me. Shortly after, my bus route changed and he was no longer my bus driver. Nick told me he'd occasionally catch the old bus driver giving him a nasty look when driving past. Looking at it now, that entire situation could have ended very, very badly. I want to thank Nick for stepping up and protecting me when he noticed that something was off. And to the bus driver, I really hope he hasn't tried to groom any other girl since me. And if he has, I pray that God sees what he did behind his wife and daughter's backs, because it's absolutely despicable. I moved into the neighborhood a few weeks before the 2015 school year started. The ad I'd answered gave little more than the basic information about this house. A mid-century three-bedroom near the high school, since I would be working at it. It sounded perfect. After a quick look around, I paid the deposit and the first month's rent. The move didn't take more than a day, I'd say. My first full day there was a sunny, cool Saturday. Just as I sat down to lunch that afternoon, I heard a knock at my door. It was a bit of a surprise. I wasn't really expecting anyone. Upon opening the door, I was greeted by a small group of elderly people. They had bright smiles and held covered dishes in their hands. I must have seemed unwelcoming but I was so shocked that I wasn't sure what to say. A moment passed before a very tall and thin man with a deep voice and salt and pepper hair stepped forward. He introduced himself and said his name was Gordon, and they were all there to welcome me to the neighborhood. I couldn't think of anything else but to just welcome them all in. We all grouped together in the living room. My guests found their seats where they could and introduced themselves. Meanwhile, those who'd brought food opened the containers and began dishing them out. That was when I realized that this was a housewarming party. It was just like something out of the 1950s. This group of people, many of whom probably grew up at the time, were welcoming me to the neighborhood with open arms. I was witnessing an aspect of America I thought had died long ago, if it ever truly existed at all. Before I even had the opportunity to take in my surroundings, I was sitting in a room full of complete strangers with beer in hand, telling them my life story. It was an experience unlike anything I've ever had, and I loved every minute of it. That was how it all began for me, and how I met a new sort of family. From that day forward, I spent as much time as I could spare getting to know everyone, 
Not everyone was quite as welcoming as the rest, though. There were quite a few grumpy old guys who seemed to really dislike me for whatever reason. They mostly stayed to themselves for the most part, though, and we agreed to disagree. The overwhelming number, however, had been the kindest and most helpful people I'd ever met. Being young and unskilled as I was especially, I found myself seeking advice from my older neighbors, probably more than I'd care to admit. Not once was I treated like the clueless little boy I often viewed myself as. I discovered that most of these ladies and gentlemen, being white-collar business people and educators, knew what it took to maintain a home. In hindsight, it should have been obvious, considering they had lived in these houses a majority of their adult lives. I quickly learned how little college had done to prepare me for my future, and only now had my true education begun. During my time living here, I had grown close to many of these nearby people, but one couple in particular were like my second set of parents. I'll refer to them as the Joneses. When they discovered I was a teacher, they took me under their wing immediately. Both of them had recently retired from the university themselves. They had also met earlier in their careers as professors and would gradually fall in love. Ed and I shared an obsession for medieval history, an obsession that would often lead to late-night discussions of personal views on this or that. Pam was no slouch herself. Her work in mathematics and physics won her several awards. We eventually started meeting every Sunday for brunch to enjoy a good meal and discuss whatever subjects came to mind. It was one of those Sundays in which the following story occurred. Somewhere around 10 to 10.30 a.m. that morning, I left the house and headed for Pam and Ed's. Along the way, I ran into another neighbor named Tom. We talked about routine gardening and lawn care for 15 minutes or so, until I continued on my walk. I was maybe 50 yards away when I saw a black van rush up into their driveway. Four men jumped out. I thought they were possibly delivering something until I saw them all pull masks over their faces and run toward the door. I wasn't sure exactly what was happening, but it seemed wise to contact the police immediately regardless. I ran back to Tom's house and let him know what I'd just seen. He called 911 right away, and we waited for the police to arrive. It wasn't very long before we watched the Joneses' house as the cops arrived and surrounded it. Officers had just rounded the corner. When we started hearing yelling, I braced for gunfire that was sure to come. Fortunately, the criminals inside surrendered without a fight, and one by one the men were led in handcuffs to police cars. None of us took the chance to relax yet, though. We had no clue if Pam and Ed were okay. Minutes passed by, but there was no sign of either one of them. When an ambulance arrived, I threw caution to the wind and ran down to the house. A few of the other neighbors were starting to show up, too. An officer stepped forward and asked us to stay back. I couldn't stand the wait. I asked if anyone had been hurt, but he refused to answer. I was becoming very agitated now. The lack of information was getting to me. A moment later, Pam stepped out, followed by Ed. They were walked over to the ambulance, where a paramedic examined them for injuries. They were terrified and a little scuffed up from being locked in the basement, but they appeared to be alright. I rushed over to where they were and gave them both a big hug. More than a few tears were shed. I could tell they needed some time to themselves to deal with what just happened. The Joneses were classy but tough people. I was confident they'd bounce back. We met back up the following Sunday, and the robbery was never spoken of. Fortunately, the robbers had all taken plea deals and went to prison where they belong in my opinion. When I was 23, I got a job at a gas station near my apartment. There was a guy about my age who used to always stop in and buy things, like beer or papers. He and I would talk about our common interests, 
and we soon discovered that we actually had a lot in common. Eventually, he asked me out, and we began seeing each other outside of my work. It wasn't anything serious until his roommate moved out. At this point, he invited me to move in, and I accepted. Now that we shared the same place, the relationship grew into something more. Even though I had my own bedroom, I slept in his bed with him most nights. My room wasn't much more than a big closet for my clothes. After six months passed by and our third roommate left, we chose not to look for someone else to replace him. This did present something of a problem, though. Without his income, we had to figure out another way to pay the bills. Mark, which is what we'll call my boyfriend, took a second job delivering pizzas. He was exhausted all the time and really hated the work, but he stayed anyway. One night we were drinking with some friends, and one of them offered to front us with some products. We agreed, and that was how we began dealing. I wasn't new to the world of illicit chemicals, but I'd never sold any before. We started out with weed, and things went very well. We only dealt with friends and kept a low profile. As long as our bills were getting paid and we had food in the pantry, we were feeling great. The bad times started when we got greedy. Here and there, people had asked for stronger stuff. We resisted for as long as we could. In hindsight, it was the worst decision we could have ever made. But we wanted to get a house of our own, and this sounded like the quickest way to get there. We were put in contact with another group, who were willing to supply us with anything. This one decision would destroy our lives. We didn't realize just how different the customer base was going to be. Mark and I had taken our own share of the hard stuff, but we'd always gotten it from friends. Our crowd was really chill compared to a lot of the other clientele we were now serving. I was used to laid-back people, the kind of people who'd hang around for a few hours and smoke with you. I met some interesting individuals in the early days, but these new people were a drastic contrast. The rule had always been to have customers hang out for a while to prevent drawing attention. We had to abandon this practice pretty quickly. We were now dealing with full-blown addicts who wanted nothing more than to score and get their fix. At first, I felt a bit sorry for them, but as time passed by, my attitude shifted to one of disgust. Most of these people would gladly sell their own children if given the opportunity. I know it sounds cruel, but even in that short period of time, I had seen some truly disgusting things. Had I known what was coming in the future, I would have been afraid instead. I had yet to meet the worst of what mankind had to offer, though. We'd been selling weed to a young guy named Sean. He wasn't a particularly talkative guy but he'd always seemed cool enough. When we expanded the operation, he started coming around a lot more and asking a lot of questions. Looking back, I should have known something was up, but it didn't register to me at the time. Late one Saturday night, he called Mark and asked if he could come by and pick up an ounce for him and a friend. Mark had the flu and I tried to get him to say no, but he assured me it would be fine. He promised he'd go back to bed right after. I reluctantly agreed. About a half hour later, Sean showed up. He grabbed his stuff and left. He seemed especially nervous, but neither Mark nor I paid any mind. He was in and out within a few minutes. Mark was in the kitchen when a knock came at the door. We weren't expecting anyone. I went over just to check. I looked through the peephole and saw Sean standing there. I assumed he must have forgotten something and opened the door for him. I hadn't even gotten the first word out before he rushed in and pushed me to the ground. A second man ran in right behind him. I couldn't do anything but yell out to Mark. I'm not sure what happened after I fell, but the sound of gunfire filled the apartment almost immediately. All I could see from my position was the second man holding a pistol and firing in the direction of the kitchen. I stumbled back to my feet and ran out of the apartment. The gunfire was still ongoing as I left. My ears were ringing. 
We had a neighbor a few units over that we'd hung out with a few times. I ran to his place and pounded on the door. It seemed like forever until he opened it and saw me. He immediately pulled me in. I guess he'd heard what was going on because he was already on the phone with 911 when I got there. He told me the cops were on their way. I ran back to the apartment to see if Mark was okay. The door was still wide open. When I got there, I was terrified. Sean and his friends were still there. I called out to Mark anyway. He didn't answer. A sick feeling churned in the pit of my stomach. I carefully and slowly walked into the apartment, calling for Mark as I went. When I turned the corner into the kitchen, I saw him lying against one of the cabinets. He was bleeding badly. I couldn't tell if he was still alive. A pistol was gripped tightly in his hand. All of a sudden, I remembered the product. I needed to get rid of it before the cops showed up. I ran to our hiding place and found it empty. Sean had more than likely planned this a long time ago and chose in that night to act. I was honestly relieved it was gone, to be honest. That garbage had been a source of friction and misery in our lives for a long time. It was their problem now. A nightmare of a life I wouldn't wish on my own worst enemy. I walked back into the kitchen and sat down next to Mark's body on the floor. Despite their hard work, the paramedics could not bring him back. I laid him to rest a few days later and tried to carry on alone. Sean would get his punishment, but not in the way I expected. I was never able to identify the second man. The police looked for Sean for a few months, until he popped up after being killed attempting to rob another dealer. I wish I could say it was a satisfying end, but I was sick of all the killing. When I'd first got myself into all of this, I didn't see any problem with peddling a little weed to a few friends. It wasn't crack or anything bad after all, but before I knew it I was a full-fledged pusher, no better than a common street thug. More than likely, I'd assisted in someone's death at least once. I was exploiting people and destroying lives just to make a quick buck. Seven years on, I still can't help but feel I had it coming. The pursuit of a quick and easy way to get ahead cost me the man I loved and left me walking through the next several years confused and riddled with guilt. I don't know if there's a moral to this story. Last year, I was at home one night. I live by myself and have a house in a quiet neighborhood. I was in my living room at around 11 p.m., watching TV. During this time, I remembered that I looked out the window and I saw a UPS truck out on the street. It was sort of parked between my front yard and my neighbor's front yard next door. I found this odd, but I didn't think too much of it. I kept watching TV until maybe midnight. Then I got a bit tired and decided to go to bed. I got up and turned the light off to the living room. And that's when I noticed that that UPS truck was still there. I was wondering why it was parked there on my street. Everybody has a driveway, so there were usually not very many cars parked on the side of the road, if any at all. I had never seen a UPS truck out at this hour. I was unaware of any neighbors that might be working for them too. It certainly was way too late for a delivery now. Still, I just kind of shrugged it off and went to get ready for bed. Several minutes later, I went back to get something I'd forgotten and noticed the truck was still there. I stopped and just kind of looked at it. I was extremely curious what was going on there. At this exact moment, I saw a man get out of the truck. He was wearing a full UPS uniform of brown pants, a brown UPS jacket, and a UPS hat and sunglasses. It looked exactly like a guy making a normal delivery, except it was at midnight. The guy was holding an average-sized square box in his hands and started walking down the street. Obviously, I kept watching him. He reached my driveway and started walking up to my house now. I was getting kind of nervous. I didn't know why he was going to my home. I knew I had not ordered anything recently. 
He walked up my driveway and then over to the front door. He looked all around him, then set the box down. Following this, he reached into his jacket and pulled what looked to be some kind of crowbar out. That's my best guess as to what it was. Now, this was really concerning. He took the crowbar object and put it up against the edge of my door. When I saw that, I immediately ran over toward the front door and turned on the outside light. When the light went on, the man concealed his crowbar device back in his jacket, then simply turned and started walking away. He calmly walked back to his truck, got inside, and then left. I called the police and told them about what happened. Ten minutes later, when the cops got there, they checked the box the guy had left on my step. It was completely empty, just a regular square cardboard box. I gave them everything I could, and they said they would look out for a UPS truck driving the area so late. About a week later, I found out a man was caught in connection to several robberies in my area. I wasn't even aware that any other robberies had taken place. It turned out to be the very same guy that was at my house. At first, they thought he worked for UPS, but soon they found out he didn't even do that. He had worked for them years prior, but was no longer an employee. I guess he posed as a delivery driver to stake out neighborhoods, and then would return at night to break into multiple houses. He did this to many homes within a mile of mine. No doubt mine would have been the very next one if I hadn't turned that light on when I did. I don't know what would have happened, but I now realize that he was probably sitting there waiting for me to go to sleep. Why he chose my house when he knew I was still inside, I don't know. But when I turned my light off, he must have figured I'd gone to bed. I'm very grateful I dodged that bullet. My friends and I were driving through Arizona after our New Year's stay in Vegas. We had to get home ASAP because one of my friends had to work. While we were driving through Arizona at around 2 a.m., I saw a figure in the middle of the lane just outside of the headlights view. I was driving and pretty tired, so I thought I was just seeing things and should relinquish the driver's seat. Then, suddenly, my friend who was in the passenger seat started screaming and pointing out the windshield. As I was driving at approximately 70 miles per hour, I could see a naked man sprinting towards our vehicle. He was waving around a gigantic log. I slammed on my brakes and swerved to miss the man. I nearly hit him. He swung the log at our vehicle and almost hit us as well. I caught a glimpse of the man's face. The only way I could describe it was a look of pure rage. After passing by him and seeing his face, I gunned it. I looked in my rear view. I could see the car behind me doing the same. There was absolutely nothing for 30 miles in any direction. No cars in the ditch, no houses, no side roads. When we reached the next town over, we finally had cell reception. We tried to call 911. As we were doing that, an ambulance screamed past us, going the exact direction we'd come from. I still have no idea what happened to that guy who we dubbed the Log Man. We have a good laugh every now and again whenever someone brings it up, but I'll never forget the image of his furious face. I have it imprinted in my mind. <laughs> 